Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff, and uh, thanks to the Cato Institute, and thanks to all of you who are here for the final paper. So I'm going to talk about common perceptions of <clears throat> CEO pay and corporate governance in the United States, talk about what the evidence is for those perceptions, and then talk about what the implications are uh, of the evidence. So what are the perceptions? You know, a lot of people will say CEOs are overpaid, uh, and there's a perception their pay keeps increasing. Uh, there's a perception CEOs are not paid for performance, and there's a perception that boards do not penalize CEOs for poor performance. And uh, you know, a few recent examples, the New York Times, you know, the top brass generally do much, much better than the rest of us you know, when times are good or bad. Uh, Forbes, which you know, wouldn't normally uh, be uh, anti-capitalism, says uh, our report will only fuel the outrage over corporate greed. Uh, and in a recent uh, Harvard Business Review, Mahir Desai, uh, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, you know, points to repeated governance failures as one of the twin crises of modern capitalism. So uh, these are recent perceptions and there are you know, past perceptions. I think this is uh, pretty consistently uh, what you hear. Now, you know, are these perceptions accurate and uh, what are the challenges uh, that are going to happen going forward? So in, in talking about what I'm going to talk about today, the recurring question is really to what extent is CEO pay and governance driven by the power of CEOs over their boards? So I think the, the perceptions are that CEOs control their boards and the CEOs are overpaid. There's an alternative view that I'll talk about where there's a competitive market for managerial talent that has CEOs being paid you know, perfectly appropriately. Uh, and then you know, there, there are presumably other forces you know, running around like political considerations and norms that may have some effect on pay and governance. So in, in addressing the perceptions, I'm really, to some extent, seeing how these three different explanations uh, support or don't support the evidence and the perceptions. And this is pretty specific on looking at these perceptions. Uh, if you're interested in a broader treatment of corporate governance, uh, there are two recent surveys that are terrific. Kevin Murphy just wrote one, uh, and Corolla and Dirk Genter wrote one, and uh, they are uh, both terrific and a little bit broader uh, than what I'm gonna talk about today. So, in thinking about CEO pay, remember there are two ways to look at pay. The first is grant date or estimated pay. This is the pay that shows up in the proxy statement. It is the pay that the board thinks it's giving to the CEO. And it's basically salary bonus, restricted stock value at grant date, and the expected value of options. That's different from what the CEOs actually get, which I'll call realized or actual pay. And it differs, realized pay differs in that they get the value of the options actually exercised, not the expected value. You can also measure restricted stock when it vests or when it's sold. And the number I'm gonna use is actually imperfect because it's also measuring restricted stock at grant date, but it's a better measure of what the CEOs get than this estimated or grant date pay. And the grant date pay though, that's the one that is really telling you what boards are doing. So if you're interested in governance, that I think is the right measure. So question, what has happened to average CEO pay of CEOs in the S&P 500 since 2000? Has it gone up, has it been flat, or has it gone down? This is you know, over the last 10 years. And I've asked this question to various audiences. I asked it to uh, a group of uh, public company CFOs. Uh, I asked it to a group of corporate governance academics, both within the last year. And in both groups, I would say two thirds set up, about one, 30% said flat, and a few people said down. So the perception that I had in the first slide is, you know, not, it's not just sort of the 
you know, man on the street or woman on the street. It is people who are in the middle of this debate. Now, let me show you what the truth is. Average CEO pay at the S&P 500 companies is down by about 40% since 2000. This is inflation adjusted. And median pay uh, is about flat since 2000. So this view that pay keeps going up and up and up is just not true. Median is flat and average is quite a bit down. And so there you go. Um, average CEO pay actually has declined since 1998. 1998 to 2010, it's down, it's way down since 2000. So that's S&P 500 CEOs. You can look at non-S&P 500 CEOs. The median has moved up some. The average, again, has come down. Uh, and the numbers are a lot lower. It's $3.5 million average uh, versus the S&P 500 is about 10. So what about pay relative to the median household. So you're always, you're also here that, you know, CEOs are paid a huge amount relative to the average household. And again, you know, the average is today is about where it was in 1997, 1998. The median about where it was in 2000, 2001. So this up and up and up, it's really stopped. This was really a phenomenon that went through, you know, the 90s. And then since 2000, it's, it's pretty much stabilized. And uh, for the S&P, uh, the non-S&P 500 CEOs, again, average has come down a bit, median uh, up a bit. What about CEO turnover? Um, you know, if you're comparing uh, the pay, you're kind of assuming that the CEOs earn that pay for the same amount of time. And it turns out in work I did with Bernadette Minton, uh, and work that I think other people uh, have also found, uh, CEO turnover kind of popped up after the mid to late 90s, so that it's been running about 20% higher uh, in the last 10 years than it did in the early and mid 90s, and then it did in the 70s and 80s. So if you wanted to to make kind of a comparison of you know, total expected comp and you want it to be apples and apples, you know, there's an argument for actually dropping the pay today by 20% relative to the pay in the 90s. And this is just uh, a look at that you see in the 92 to 98, it was sort of not over 15% in any one year and uh, really since 2000 it's been over 15%. Uh, in a lot of years. So CEOs are not paid more and more, uh, and CEO tenures have declined. So a little bit different from the perceptions. But, you know, these numbers are still big, right? They're still paid a lot relative to the average household. And so, you know, maybe they're, they're still overpaid. And, you know, it's very hard to, to get a sense of that. So what I'm gonna do is compare them to other similar groups. And what we know from you know, the Piketty and size evidence is that the income share at the top has gone up a lot uh, since 1980. And uh, this is a very well-known graph. It went up, you know, it came down, went up, it peaked in 2007 and has since come down. Uh, and this is uh, a look at the last uh, 20 years where we have good compensation data. So the question I want to ask is how have the public company CEOs done to done relative to other people who make a lot of money who we know have also done well? And let's take a look. Um, and what I'm comparing now the 500 S&P 500 CEOs to the average taxpayer in the top 0.1%. So it's about 140,000 taxpayers. And again, you know, how have the CEOs done relative to other people in this you know, very well-paid group? And uh, this is the ratio. And what you see is uh, it actually, the CEOs did a little bit better uh, from 94 to 2001. 
And then they've done quite a bit worse from 2001 to 2010. And CEOs relative to the top 0.1% today are about where they were in 1994. Uh, the non-S&P 500 CEOs, actually a little bit worse off. So what do you take from that? You know, the CEOs are not the only ones who've earned a lot more. Uh, their relative pay relative to people in those top groups, you know, is basically the same, or maybe a little bit less, and uh, that just tells you pay increases have been systemic at the top end. The CEOs don't turn out to be hugely different. Um, what about the longer term? So here, there's no one time series that actually captures CEO pay. I was just looking at ExecuComp, which is nice because it has a nice 20 year time series. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna staple together two other data sets to the ExecuComp data, and it's not a perfect stapling. You know, one of the data sets is Corolla's, and maybe she'll have something to say about that. Um, but I'm trying to go back to the 1930s, and I'm gonna look at pay again relative to the average pay of the top 0.1%. And I'm also going to look at pay relative to the average company stock market value uh, because there, you know, there's a paper by Gebex and Landier who build a competitive model for talent in which pay depends on average firm size. And they predict that pay in a competitive market pay should go up with average firm size. So what do we see uh, pay relative to the top 0.1%? Well, in uh, 2010, it's about two times, CEO pay is about two times the average of the top 0.1%. It's about where it was in the 1930s. And in fact, the average over uh, this long sample period uh, is about two, and that's where it is today. So um, CEO pay kind of moves around, but historically it's about twice the income of uh, the top 0.1%. Uh, and you can see some, the puzzle, I guess, there is uh, why the ratios were so low in the uh, early and mid 80s and why the ratio was so high in the late 90s. It's kind of back today where it was or where it is on average. Um, now CEO paid a market value of uh, the average company. And uh, this is something, again, where Gebex and Landier said it should be flat. And uh, interestingly, uh, since 1960, it's been pretty flat. Before 1960, it was higher. So maybe CEOs were actually overpaid relative to this competitive model, if you take it seriously, before 1960. But since then, it's been pretty flat. And this is, you can see the ratio 60 to 2010. And uh, actually, in 2010, it's actually on the, the little bit the low side uh, of the last 50 years. So the bottom line, you know, it actually looks consistent with uh, Gebex and Landier since the 60s. Uh, the puzzle is why Gebex and Landier didn't work before the 60s and actually why it was higher rather than, than lower. So that's, you know, in the, you know, the long time series. Now let's look a little bit more specifically uh, about who earns more. And there's a really nice paper by Bakija Cole and Heim, uh, who access IRS tax return data, and they get information on uh, the company or the, uh, the person's uh, employment. It's not perfect because the IRS you know, can't let, give you that good data legally, but they distinguish between uh, people who have income from salary, uh, and those are more likely to be executives in public companies versus uh, executives who uh, get more in business income than in salary, uh, and these people are more likely to be in closely held businesses. And what you can see here uh, is that the closely held business executives saw their pay increase by more than the public executives or the salaried executives. And that's, uh, you know, their share of the top 0.1%, but it's gone up much more in the closely held businesses. And this is the, the number or the percentage of the executives who are in the top 0.1%. And again, the big increase 
is in the closely held people, it's actually been quite a decline in the public executives. Now, now what does that mean? Why is that important? Um, well, if you're thinking of the managerial power story where these pay increases are driven by CEOs power over boards and boards are not doing their jobs and people are being overpaid, you would have kind of thought the result would be the opposite direction. In the closely held businesses, those are businesses where usually the owners are in charge and uh, there isn't an agency problem. So that's on the executive front. Looks like the public company executives, again, done about the same as the top 0.1% over a long period of time. It's the private company executives have done better than the public company executives. What about another group that is sort of related? Uh, lawyers. You know, lawyers do business. They come from, you know, not exactly the same group as CEOs, but, you know, it's probably the same uh, group of undergrads. Uh, what's happened to pay at the top law firms? Well, look at the picture. Pay at the top law firms has more than doubled in real terms uh, over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And uh, how about law partners to uh, S&P 500 CEOs? Yeah, you know, it's the same pattern. Started at six, the S&P 500 CEOs did better through 2000, and then they came back down. And today, uh, the S&P 500 CEOs are about the same place relative to law partners that they were uh, in 1994. Um, actually, the non-S&P 500 CEOs have done worse uh, relative to the law partners over that period. So. Again, CEOs are not the only ones who earn a lot. And the last comparison I'll show you, which is maybe a little bit unfair, uh, is to take the 25 top hedge fund managers and compare their pay to the pay of the 500 S&P 500 CEOs. And the hedge fund managers are a little unfair because some of that pay, a lot of that pay is fee income, some of the pay is their uh, return on their investment. Um, but the magnitudes are pretty stunning. So uh, what you see there is uh, before 2004, you know, the 25 top hedge fund managers earned about the same as all 500 S&P 500 CEOs, which means the average hedge fund manager earned 20 times the average uh, S&P 500 CEOs. And those ratios just increased uh, after 2004. Uh, and uh, in 2010, it was four times. So that means that uh, 25 people earn four times 500, uh, which means the average earned 80 times, I think that's right if I'm doing my math correctly, uh, 80 times more. The average hedge fund manager that group did 80 times more than the S&P 500 CEO. So what does all this mean? Why did I show you all this? Pay increases have been pervasive at the very top. You've got these other groups, investors, lawyers, I didn't show you athletes, uh, have seen significant pay increases uh, where there is a competitive market for talent uh, and no agency problems exist. And the increases are at least as large as for the CEOs. You've got these private company executives with fewer agency problems who've increased by more than public company executives. And so, so it's just making the point that if you, you look at the high CEO pay, as evidence of managerial power or capture, you've got to explain why these other groups who are really in a similar pool, not the athletes, but the other groups are, are I would say, a similar pool, why they've had a similar or either or higher growth in pay. So suggests that the market for talent uh, has been an important part of the increase in CEO pay. Uh, and uh, that uh, those forces, you know, have bid up the pay uh, across sectors. And, uh, you know, is this poor governance? You know, most evidence on governance is that governance has improved. Boards have gotten more independence. There's more institutional shareholder pressure. So it's hard to, it's hard to see why, again, CEO pay hasn't grown any more than these other groups. Governance, if anything, has gotten better. And what does it leave you with? It really leaves you, at least me, with the idea that um, technological change and greater scale 
uh, increase the returns at the top. It's a Quebec's Landier type story. And you can manage or apply talent to greater assets, to larger companies. Uh, the traders can trade larger sums of money. Uh, the entertainers or athletes can access larger audiences. And this seems a lot more or more consistent with the evidence than the managerial power story. So that's pay levels. What about whether CEOs are paid for performance? And uh, Josh Rao and I looked at uh, how CEOs were paid uh, relative to um, performance. And uh, one thing we did, we took the most highly paid CEOs uh, and compared them to the least highly paid CEOs. We did that within size class uh, because pay tends to increase with size. And what you find is that within, within every size quintile, uh, the highest compensation group, and this is, this is realized pay, uh, had much higher returns than the lowest paid group. So like if you look at uh, that first quintile, the smaller firms, the lowest paid CEOs, uh, three-year stock performance negative 20%, and the most highly paid CEOs 140% uh, stock performance, and that's industry uh, adjusted. So within any size class, you see the more highly paid people are the ones whose companies have performed best. You can do this one year stock performance, three years, five years, uh, you get the same result. And uh, that's in the cross section. You know, if you look at realized pay in the time series, uh, you see that realized pay actually also moves with the overall stock market. So again, there is pay for performance. Um, next question, uh, do boards monitor uh, or are CEOs penalized for poor performance? And uh, Bernadette Mitten and I in this paper on turnover found a strong relation of turnover to performance. Uh, and then in a more recent paper, uh, Genter and Llewellyn looked at CEO turnover in the S&P 500 or the S&P Execucomp database. And what they did is they took CEOs and looked at what their stock performance was over their first five years and then looked at how likely they were to be, uh, to remain or be fired. And what this shows is that CEOs in the bottom quintile of performance, again, performance relative to industry, 60% of them lost their jobs. CEOs in the top quintile, fewer than 20%. So there's a huge difference in turnover based on performance, meaning not only is there pay for performance, but it's also the case that if you don't perform, you know, your job is, is at risk these days. And they then, you know, distinguished between uh, dependent and independent boards, and, and independent boards had more independent uh, directors and more stock ownership on the board, and those differences widened. That uh, if you were uh, in the bottom uh, quintile, like 80% of the time you lost your jobs. Uh, if you were in the top quintile, only 10%. So what's the evidence on the perceptions? You know, the perceptions are are, I think, to some extent, misperceptions. Uh, CEO pay has declined uh, since 2000. Uh, average CEO pay is more or less at historical levels. Uh, and uh, public company executives have actually not done as well as private company executives. Uh, it looks like CEOs are paid for performance. And you can ask whether the pay for performance could be stronger. You know, I don't really, that's a hard question. Some people think pay for performance can be stronger. Although some people think it should be weaker, you know, in the finan you know, for financial companies, there's some people who would make that argument. So I'm not weighing in on that, but I am weighing in on the fact that there is quite a lot of pay for performance. Uh, boards uh, do penalize CEOs for poor performance, and turnover's gone up. So, you know, don't listen to me. What do shareholders think? Um, Dodd Frank actually mandated that all publicly traded companies 
uh, needed to have a shareholder vote on the compensation of the top five executives. And those votes are known as say on pay votes. Uh, we had the first votes in 2011. And uh, if you believe the perceptions and the managerial power story, you would expect you know, a lot of negative votes. If you think it's a market for talent, you'd expect positive votes. And what were the votes? 98% of the companies got majority approval in 2011. Uh, that approval rating ratio is about the same this year, so it wasn't a fluke last year. And if you look at you know, the approval ratings, 80% of companies received more than 80% approval. So what does that say? The largely positive votes are not consistent with the perceptions, uh, and they're consistent with a stronger role for a competitive market for talent than for managerial power. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, there are bad apples, and I'm sure there's some exercise of managerial power. Uh, the say on pay votes give you some avenue to affect that, and the people who got companies that got the low votes uh, have had to make some adjustments on what they pay people. So last thing, and this is always dangerous because it's a moving target, how have companies performed? Uh, if we had this governance crisis, you would expect you know, performance has been awful. And uh, you know, the stock market has been up and down. Obviously, we just had a financial crisis and a deep recession. But what's really interesting is operating margins, which is basically cash flow to sales for the S&P 500 companies is at the highest it's been in the last 20 years, and actually higher than it's been for quite some time. And uh, you know, debt levels are uh, relatively low, uh, and cash we know is relatively high. So if you look on an operating basis, and that the green line at the top is the operating margin, uh, you see the companies have actually delivered on performance, which is probably another reason why the say on pay votes were so positive. And uh, why is it not going forward again? There we go. Uh, so the companies have performed well. I mean, it's also true that uh, the uh, national, you know, the NIPA accounts, you know, corporate profits are at an all-time high uh, as a percentage of GDP or, you know, historically very high. And again, that's consistent with this good performance. The NIPA accounts, of course, include both private and public companies, so it's not uh, completely comparable. So bottom line, the three perceptions uh, that I talked about, the reality is a lot more complicated, uh, and the evidence is at odds with the perception. Uh, Kevin Murphy, in his summary, you know, or in his uh, survey, does say it's complicated, and you know, you can't disagree with that. Uh, it's likely that efficient contracting or market for talent, uh, managerial power, uh, and political issues coexist. And uh, you know, there have clearly been governance failures and payout liars where managerial power is exercised, and that leads to these negative perceptions. Uh, the numbers are very large relative to the median household, and that also uh, is very um, you know, hard to understand, I think, in many cases, and leads to these perceptions. Um, but that said, you know, there looks like a meaningful part of pay is driven by this market for talent. It's moved with it. Uh, pay is tied to performance, and boards hold CEOs accountable. So what does this mean? means, you know, boards face a hard problem. Uh, the market for talent, you know, pushes them to reward top people a lot. Um, the pay levels are high. Um, but, you know, you want to, you know, make sure you get the people you want. But the combination of these very visible high pay levels, some examples of bad behavior, and a weak economy creates you know, real criticism, and you see that uh, in the business press uh, pretty regularly. So the challenge is you know, to pay enough to retain who you want and pay for performance, but at the same time deal with these real political uh, and public constraints. 
And uh, with that, uh, let me make one prediction and then I'll stop. Um, if this analysis is correct, what do, you, what do you predict going forward? Well, yeah, I'm saying CEO pay moves with other top incomes. And one group, the finance incomes, you know, appear to have declined or are declining. That's actually going to put some downward pressure on CEO pay, I would think, over the next few years. Uh, you've got political forces and say on pay votes probably exerting some downward pressure. And then you've got the economy and the stock market. And when those decline, you also see downward pressure. When they improve, you see upward pressure. So I would guess that you know, in the next year or two, you're not likely to see big increases in CEO pay. If anything, you'll see declines if the econ you know, depending on what the economy and stock market do. But I would imagine when the economy and stock market do improve, you'll see some upward pressure again. And uh, there you go. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much.